Can you hear me? Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming for this session. I understand that it has been a long day and this is the last session, so I'm the only one standing between now and the beer later. So I hope I'll make it, um, I'll make it uh, short. So the title of this talk is the Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Scala Implicits But Weren't Sure How to Ask. So I don't think I will be able to tell you everything about the implicits. That's, we have an expert there. But on the other hand, I think I sh can show you a way how you can actually ask at least how the implicits are being used. All right. So um, actually, I just put my name, but the, uh, it's, a, it's a work of uh, these people as well. Uh, so it was actually Heather Miller who came to us to, to say like it would be actually quite interesting to look at how this feature is being uh, used. So I'm a researcher in programming languages and um, implicits is, is this kind of a language feature which is not really widespread. Right? It's just in, in, in a, quite a few uh, programming languages, and it's nowhere near is u used as much as in Scala. And, and so it's kind of interesting to, to try to figure out how are big people actually using it, what sort of patterns do they use it for, and, and things like that. All right. So, but let's start with a quick warm up. Can you hear me like this? So I don't have to hold the mic. So, I'm typing. Uh, so sorry. All right, so um, if you know a little bit of a Scala programming, um, you should know what's going to be the result of this, All right? It's not surprising, just adds five to Scala IO. That's pretty cool. So what will happen if I do a multiplication? Also quite nice. Now let's try something else. Let's see what is this, you know? If I multiply a number with a string, well, it's false. <laughs> Interesting, right? All right, so what happens if I multiply false by a number? I get true. <laughs> wow. So what happens if I keep adding Scala <laughs> IO after that? None. <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? Um, so everybody is happy with this or? So the ones who are not, they probably know the reason. Um, the reason is that you are being a little bit deceived. Right? So you see this, that's what I typed. But in fact, what happened is that you, it was this. So this is actually the code that was, that was compiled and that was run. And the name of the, uh, the, the, the classes there should kind of uh, give a suggestion to a lightning tool which was was done in code mesh in 2012 by Gary Bernard, which this this kind of what thing, right? Because what happened was that when I started the uh, the ammonite shell, uh, I have this predef.cs, which is a file which was run at the beginning, and it put all these implicits in place, right? So then I can make the fun, and I think it's pretty cool because unlike in other languages, you know, in Scala you can define your own what. You know, you don't have to rely on the built-ins. You can make any what you want. That's pretty nice. All right. So let's, on the more serious side, what I want to show you uh, today is a little bit of an overview of what the implicits uh, are right now and the kind of a usage that we know about. It's going to be like an uh, implicit 101. So maybe you already know everything. I don't know. Um, then I'm going to show you how would you analyze their usage. If you would really like to ask what are actually people are using, what are doing with implicits, and then I will show you some of the results of when we actually executed it and look in the, uh, in the large set of projects. So what are implicits? Well, actually, there was the, uh, a talk at the uh, Principles of Programming Languages by Martin Odersky uh, this year. And what he said that is, if this is one feature that makes Scala Scala, it's implicit parameters. Right? So the implicits are really like one of the major things that you find in Scala, not in, uh, in, other, in other languages. I guess these are the two major things what implicits do. They help you to reduce boilerplate by leveraging the knowledge that the compiler has about your code, right? And also they provide a convenient way to implement language features outside of the compiler, right? So if you are a language designer, right, you have to kind of uh, figure out what you are going to kind of uh, <coughs> do in the language itself and what can be done in libraries. And in Scala, there is this implicit feature which actually allow us to do a lot of things which doesn't have to be baked inside the language itself. It's quite an interesting, you know, it's a nice trade-off that uh, that's happening. 
All right. Um, let's illustrate one of these things on a simple example. So I have a case class. Um, I have two instances, L1 and L2. And what I'm going to do is I would like to compare them, right? So basically here I'm creating a tuple, and here I'm creating a tuple, right? That's an easy way because both are integers, so I can compare them like that. And this code will actually compile, right? That's quite nice. The reason why it will compile it, if you will import this uh, implicit in scope, the Scala compiler will rewrite it into this one, right? So what it does is that it takes the tuple, in, uh, it uh, converts it from ordering to audit, right? So it basically puts a particular way how you are going to order things. And then for it to work, it needs to know how it actually, it needs to know some kind of a strategy for how do you actually ordering things. Well, and there is some, some in, the, in the scope, which is the default tuple 2, and tuple 2 needs to know how actually to order its elements, right? And that's going to be a default ordering for integers. So it's quite a lot of code that the Scala compiler <coughs> made for us. And you can make it uh, even, you know, if I expand this, there is basically no magic, right? You have the, uh, this is the implicit def, the tuple 2, it takes two orderings, which will be an int and int in this case, and then int ordering is basically just comparing using Java lang integer. Right? There's no magic, but it's quite a lot of code that the Scala compiler did for us, and that's kind of nice. We can even make it further, right? If I add to the location a file, which is the uh, Java IO file, then I can still write this code. Right? Now I have the tuple of three and tuple of three here, and it will go, it's going to rewrite it even for more. Right? There's quite a lot of code. It's the, the Scala compiler adds more code than we actually wrote in this case. Right? That's, a, that's, that's really nice. So what it actually does, and what I find really like, super interesting on implicits, is that actually make code which is invisible. Right? So you see this, but in fact, we have to think about all of this inside. Right? And what is interesting in Scala is that this is being used on really large scale, and it kind of works, right? Or it works in most of the cases. There are some corner cases where it might be confusing, and you might look into some of them. But that's really, you know, because otherwise you can do all of this, obviously, without implicit, but you will have to write the code yourself. All right. So we have two forms of implicits. We have implicit conversions, and we have implicit parameters. So let's look at the implicit conversion. This is more from the documentation. So the implicit conversion is between two type, S and T, is defined either as an implicit value of type S to T, so it's basically a function type, or an implicit method. And, it's impl uh, and it can be applied in two cases. The, uh, the one is that if you are using an expression as a particular type, and you are expecting some other type, right? So it will do the conversion on fly, or if you have a selector. Right, so you, that's the, probably the one that most of the people knows that you can actually inject kind of a new method to an existing type, and then this is exactly when it's going to be used. All right. So one of the uh, use cases for implicit conversion is adaptation. Right here in the in this concrete example, what I have that I'm basically converting into two types which are kind of the same. So if I import this, uh, this language feature flag allowing me to do implicit conversion, I can safely do this. And it's completely a valid case. It's basically as essentially an, an, um, an adapter pattern, right? So I have two things, and I can implicitly convert from one to the other without doing much job. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> other way how I can define them, so the, this is the, uh, the implicit def then I can actually define them as implicit while because this is the, uh, the, the value from S to T. I can also define them as implicit object, right? So the, uh, the, the major difference between these two and this one is that the only the implicit def can take type parameters, right? So if later you would like to use it for kind of deriving new types or something like that, you need to use the uh, implicit def. But we will talk about this a bit later. Um, the other case is extension. That's, I think, has been used a lot, especially at the beginning of Scala. That was when people really embrace it, um, then you can actually add uh, a new methods into classes that already uh, existed. You, that are, and, uh, they are sealed. You cannot open them, and you cannot change their code. 
right? So here I have a, some URL, whatever that is, and I can define a new method which is called local, and basically it will compare the scheme if it's file, and then it will work like this, right? That hopefully make perfect sense. Um, so how about if I do it this way? You know, is this a valid extension? So instead of dev, I now do val, you know, val local, boolean, and all that. Does it look right? Well, actually, it is. It will, it will compile and it will work. But what happened if I, so if I do val, it kind of suggests that there's a value, right? And it makes kind of sense because the URL itself is actually, let's say that it's an immutable class, right? So I create instance once, and you know, if it's local, it is either true or, or false, right? It's not never going to change, so I can cache this value. I mean, this is a trivial example, but maybe I will do much more computation. So, you know, making it a val kind of makes sense in a way that, you know, I don't want to execute it all the time. But to prove my point here, I added a side effect, right? I will print high from this. And then I have, I constructed once the URL, and then I'm calling it twice, right? And the question is, what's going to be printed, right? And I guess you already can see the thing there. It's going to be printed twice, right? Because what the compiler will do is that injects the, uh, the conversion twice there, right? So this is just, if you are trying to be smart and catch something using uh, a val as the, uh, instead of doing the, uh, the, uh, the extension methods using dev, that will not work, right? Um, there's another kind of uh, conversion which is interesting, and it's more about the, uh, the the rules. So where actually Scala is looking for the different conversions. So say that you see this kind of a code somewhere, and that's actually what I saw, and it get me confused at the beginning. So there is some kind of a URL class, right? And then I have a client, and there is a method defined called download, and it downloads a URL. And then later in the code, I saw someone calling it with just a string. And that was like, it's kind of neat, right? I can just use string. I don't have to create a new instance of URL and all that. But it was kind of a tricky to see how these things are related. And that even if you, because you know, there is no new or something like that. It's just a plain, plain string. And if you look how the, uh, the, the URL is defined, just a case class, a bunch of things. But the, uh, you know, how do you convert from this one to here? And this is the old code. You know? There is no magic conversion or extra conversion imported, actually. And it turned out that it can be done in this way. So essentially, it's the accompanying object URL can define an implicit apply a string and construct a URL. It's a kind of nice way, but if you are not really familiar with the, all the rules where actually Scala looks for, for implicits, then it might be a little bit confusing. Now, if you use an IDE like the uh, IntelliJ uh, <coughs> idea, then you can actually expand the, ex uh, the implicits and they will show you the, the hints and then you can actually see exactly what's happening and that's super useful. All right, so to sum up the implicit conversion, it can be a bit confusing, especially you know, if you miss an import, right? So you copy some code from a Stack Overflow, you forget an import or something like that and then suddenly you know, the whole thing is red and you don't know what is happening. Um, it can be a bit dangerous, right? Especially if you are converting from, like, you know, every, every integer you will automatically convert into an, uh, a string or something like that, right? So then it might be, a, might be a bit bad. So you have to use it with care, right? And, the, uh, and what I heard that in Scala 3, there's going to be actually some sort of a limitation of this crazy conversion. So they will basically forbid you to do any conversion which are not codified with their target type unless you override it with some kind of a magic import or something like that. Okay. So now we have implicit parameters. So that's uh, another interesting thing. And that's actually the most interesting thing of, of the implicits because that allow you to do a lot of interesting stuff that we will look at into it, right? But it's basically that you can mark a parameter list of a, uh, of a method definition or a function with uh, to be implicit. And then if you are not passing these things directly, then the compiler will look in the uh, implicit scope and will try to find and fill it for you, right? And that's really cool. So people are using it a, a lot when they are 
establishing context and, and, and other things. And these are the, uh, I guess, the major uh, use cases for, for implicit. So we've already seen the extension methods. And then these are, there are a bunch of other ones which are actually using the implicit parameters, right? And um, I would like to look at a few of them so we are then all on the same page. So uh, type classes, uh, maybe you already know. If you, if you do, then this is going to be a kind of a boring repetition. Maybe there's someone new who doesn't really know exactly. Um, I'll make this kind of a basic example of like, you have a, some class and you would like to uh, serialize it into JSON, all right? And the um, one way how you can do it is that, well, you create some kind of a representation of your JSON, which will be just a wrapper of a string. You can have a full JSON hierarchy, but for the sake of this example, make it uh, simple. Then you will have uh, some JSON serializable trait, right? Then I have my serialized method, which basically in this case only prints the, uh, the result of whatever is stored in the JSON. And then I just make my player to extend JSON serializable, right? And this is this kind of ad hoc polymorphism which is not really good, right? Because of many things, but one of them, the easiest to imagine is that what if I don't own the player, right? Then it's kind of tricky because I cannot just made it uh, easily uh, extend something. So then I will have to start adding more types into my hierarchy and make an extension from a player with this thing included and that's getting kind of messy, right? And then also what, what happened if I would like to serialize a sequence of players, you know? And these things wouldn't work much either, you know? I will have to, again, figure out some kind of way how I can make a global function which will take a sequence of things and, and things like that. So it's not very modular. Um, so we can do better. And we can do better that we actually separate the responsibilities, right? So all the code that we have to inject into the uh, into person, we actually put them uh, outside. Oops. So what I have here is that I have my trait. Right, then I define the serializer there, and I parameterize it with A, so I can do a JSON serializer of any A. Right, Then I still have my serialize method, which will just going to print the result of whatever I pass in the, uh, in the serialize here. And then I make a special case here for a player. And this is just a value, right? nothing more. I can make it an object if I want. And then I can nicely call a serializer with player, and here I say which function is responsible to actually providing that particular behavior for player, okay? And I get the same result. And this is something called the, uh, the, the concept pattern, and you don't need any implicits for that, right? It's just a plain Scala code, and you can do it in other O languages. But it's nice because it already separates the responsibility for something is that is a player, which is not a serializable, right? There is a difference in the way how you look at these, the, the object structure. Well, with implicits, you can make it the code much nicer. And it's, again, the idea of reducing the boilerplate, right? Because what you can do is that you can say, well, the, the serialize, it actually can serialize any A. And the strategy is going to come as an implicit parameter, right? That's basically how you handle dependencies in your code, right? So now this dependency will be injected by the compiler for you. You don't have to provide it automatically. Ah, sorry, you don't have to provide it manually. Right? Then I only need to uh, define that the, uh, the player to join that is implicit, and I have my code, and here I don't have to specify which is the strategy. It's going to be synthesized automatically, and if there is no confusion, like there would be two strategies, for example, it will compile and run. Well, the nice thing with this is that if I would like to have a sequence of players and serialize them, the only thing I need to do is to say, well, how do I represent the sequence of things in JSON? which is basically just you know, in the square bracket separated by comma. And then here I say, well, basically, I can serialize everything, every sequence of some type t, such that, that the t of itself knows how to serialize itself. Right? So I can find the instances of the JSON serializer of particular t. Right? And then I can have all this to work. So can we do even better? Well, uh, what we can do is that we can actually now make an implicit conversion, which adding the to JSON method. And so the whole thing will read more like an OO code, right? But the nice thing is that I put the, uh, the to JSON externally, right? The original player class, you know, it's, it's not modified. I only added it extra after. So if I import, I have this function functionality. If I don't import it, I don't have it. You can do even better. 
And there's, if I use the library, for example, like the CIRC, uh, which does the, uh, the JSON serialization, it can actually generate all that for me. Right? I don't even have to write a single serializer. So it can do all the uh, products and, and, and co-products together. So the only thing I need to do is to actually put a bunch of imports. And that's the thing I need to know which ones. And if I have them, then this whole code will work. And that's pretty cool. And there's a lot of libraries nowadays that we see, and from the analysis that we do, that actually use that uh, this trick a lot. You know, so they actually can der derive the type classes instances for you. Okay. Um, and then again, you know, this is how it's going to be expanded. So I have, you know, first I need to convert the players into uh, into the some operations on which the as JSON is defined, and then here is the derivation of all the uh, all the functionality needed to synthesize the, uh, the, the serializer for, the, uh, for this particular player class. So the, uh, the other kind of a, a useful uh, use case for implicit is evidence of properties, right? So for example, if you have a, a list of lists and you would like to define uh, a flatten method, Right? So if access is the uh, list of lists of some t, then a flatten will return a list of t. And I would like to do it locally on an instance. You know, global is kind of easy, but if you do it locally, that's kind of a hard problem. And then again, if you are a language designer, right, you have different options what you can do. Right? Maybe you can just make some kind of a specialized constructs in the language. That's the way how I think C Sharp went. They have this generalized type construct, and then something baked in the language. Right? In Scala, it's again solved by implicit. And it's kind of neat. So the way how it works is that you basically have your list here, you define your flatten, and you put this evidence here, this implicit parameter where you are actually asking, well, is A, which is here, an instance of some list B? And if so, then this one will work. You know, this method is defined. If not, that would be a compile error. So the way how it works is that if I have a list of lists and I call it flatten, then it's fine. On the other hand, if I have just the list, of numbers in this case, then I will actually get an error message. And the error message here is going to be that cannot prove that the int is a subclass of a list of b, which might be a little bit cryptic, but at least gives you a hint that there's something, something wrong with the type, and it allows us to define this. And it's kind of nice that you can actually, this message is provided by the author of the library. It's not in the compiler itself. So it's done with this implicit not found uh, annotation, right? So what we are actually saying here, so here you can provide a custom message. So this is the way how you can, from the user code or from library code, you can kind of uh, interact with compiler and provide a hints. So then when the user do something, then they might uh, get a better error message, which will more direct them to where the problem might be, all right? And all of these constructs that I've used here, they are just methods, classes, traits, and things in the language. There's nothing baked in the compiler. Right, that's the uh, that's the cool way. Um, another usage is the uh, establishing context. That's another kind of big thing you probably have seen if you are using the uh, the ACA actors. That's one of the things which is being used a lot for any kind of uh, uh, scheduling of of tasks. The executor context. That's another thing which is passed a lot. And in the Scala compiler, there's actually a context being passed a lot as well. So it's nice that if you use this implicit parameter then you don't have to specify the context all around, right? You only specify it here that you get it, but you don't have to call the function and pass it along. And again, in the Scala tree, there's going to be uh, more things that you can actually uh, do with this. All right, so what is the, uh, there are some downsides of, of implicits. Um, mostly because uh, if you use it a lot, they might a little bit hurt the readability, right? Because it's something which is not in the syntax, right? That's the uh, it's still the, the, the thing that it's something that the compiler injects. So if you don't know how it works, it might be a little bit confusing, um, especially if you are missing an import. And the annotation can help you doing that. Um, I have this kind of a maybe a little bit contrived example, but it kind of a shows the potential danger that you can run into it. You know, imagine that you have this kind of a module called P1, which defines some class, defines some trait, and then I have some kind of an implicit conversion, which just uh, provides a definition of A for the class uh, for the case class A, okay? And then I have in some other file, I import this module, I have some method, and at some point I'm calling a.f, 
All right? Perfectly fine. And as you might expect, it will print P1. No surprise there. But then what will happen if I do later uh, a new module called P2, there I will have an implicit class. You know, again, it has a method f. And this one print P2. You know? So far, so good. Nothing happens because I only imported the uh, P1. But then what happens if I suddenly later import P2 because I need some other things from this P2? You know? Now, if I run this, what will happen? There's not going to be any compile error or something like that. That's going to be P2 will be printed. So by adding an import, I change the semantics of my program. Right? So that might be a guess you wouldn't really find many cases like this. You know, it has to be uh, like uh, precisely curved because of the, uh, of the rules. But it can happen, right? Because people, especially if you have a lot of people working on the same code base, then you have to be kind of aware of it. And that's one of the things what I see a lot is that there are a lot of people doing a really neat and nice libraries, but usually a lot of, of the uh, like hidden details that the authors of these libraries had to learn, they kind of resurface. And then you as a user, you know, at the beginning, all oh, is nice and shiny, but eventually when starts, well, things start to break, then you have to basically go through the same learning process as the original author of the library. And that's where the, uh, these strings, uh, things can get uh, pretty confusing. The other thing is that, you know, when I saw you, when I, <laughs> when I saw you, when I show you the, uh, the, the serialization of the sequence, that was basically uh, a type derivation, right? Because I have, uh, one thing was to serialize just a person or, or a player, and second was to serialize sequence. And then suddenly, the Scala compiler for me, it created a type which was serializing a player, or sequences of players, right? So in this simple case, it was fairly easy, but if you have way bigger uh, code bases, then this might hurt a performance a lot, right? So you might end up with having a compilation time over 30 minutes or 45 minutes or, or something like that, and that's just crazy. And there, usually, the, uh, the, the one of the trick is that you can actually look at, you know, there is the, uh, the, the Scala Center, they provide a plugin which is called uh, Scala C Profile, I believe. And you can actually run your uh, compiler with that and it will tell you the different phases and how long each phase took. And that might help you to kind of uh, guideline where, the, the, where a problem might occur. All right, so that was the uh, implicit 101. Um, now, let's see how we analyze how people are actually using. So this whole thing started uh, with this paper uh, that uh, Martin Oderski and others uh, presented this year at Popol. And that was basically about the abstracting the context and, and creating the, uh, uh, the implicit function types. And in there, in the appendix A, uh, what Heather did was that she looked at the 100 of 120 open source Scala projects, you know, sorted by the, uh, the number of stars at the, at the GitHub, and tried to grab for you know, if they are actually using some implicits. Because the question is, you have so many things that you can do with implicits, but are they actually being used? Because implicits, implicit parameters are in Haskell, and they are not being used, right? So the question was, well, can we run this study, but instead of grab, do something else, and actually figure out more precisely how implicits are being used? And we can, because we have GitHub, right? So we have access uh, to many, many projects, and it's kind of amazing. Um, I checked about uh, a week ago, and there were about 80, uh, sorry, 98,000 of, of Scala projects available on GitHub. Right? So there's a lot of code that we can try to actually answer these questions. But then the tricky part is, if you look back to this code, how do we actually find where the implicits are? Right? I mean, I can download all the code. That's easy. Um, maybe I can find the definitions because I can see your well, implicit def, implicit class, implicit val. But still, what I will need to figure out, what are the types? And the call sites. The call sites that are using implicit, that's a tricky thing to, to, to figure out, right? Because what I would ideally want is, given this code, I get all these definitions, right? And I get the expanded type class. But for that, I will really have to make my own compiler or hook to some other compiler because otherwise it's just impossible to, uh, to answer. Well, and it turned out that actually someone did that, and there is this project Scala Meta. And that's a, it's this really cool library 
Um, and it allows you to do th two things. It has, the, uh, it has the syntactic API and the semantic API. So in the syntactic one, it basically allow you to turn code into AST, so then you can basically browse in a nice way the, uh, the code itself. And it has the, uh, the semantic part. So it can help you to understand the, uh, what symbols are. It can, uh, you can understand that, OK, this is a function call, actually. And the function call is calling this method, which is in this class. And it has these type parameters. So it kind of gives, it's like a holy grail for anyone who wants to do a, a, a static analysis in, in, in Scala. And it's used in, in many projects, like uh, the uh, Scala format, the Scala fix, methods, and, and many others. So now let's look at the, uh, the, the semantic DB. So the semantic DB is a part of the, uh, the, the Scala meta. And what it is, it's a, it's a data model which gives you all the semantic information for a given compilation unit. And it's stored in the, uh, so basically you have a tool, you run it on a Scala source code, and it provides you these uh, semantic DBs. And these are in the uh, Google protocol buffer. And the guy specify you know, the whole data model, how it looks like. So I'll show it on a quick example. So let's say that we have this package P, we define some object, and there we have just a, a little bit of a code. Then if I run these two tools, the uh, Scala C is basically like a, uh, sorry, the meta C is basically like a Scala C. So it will compile this thing and generates the, uh, the, the database. And then I have the meta P, which will just print uh, in a human readable format, the content of the, uh, of the semantic DB. So this is what you will end up with. So there is some kind of a summary of what has been there. But what is interesting is that you have these occurrences. So it already tells you that you know, on the line three, you are actually have an occurrence of the pre-dev dot arrow asoc, right? So that's really cool. So it actually resolves everything which is in the code. And that's because this is being rewritten to the arrow asoc. So there is an implicit conversion for any to, uh, to this type which defines the, uh, the, the, the arrow operation. Um, so that's already quite cool. We would just need one more thing and to actually tell us what are the bits and pieces that the compiler actually inserted. And we can do that if we just say that we turn on the, the syntactics on. And if you do that and we recompile the whole thing, then we get these syntactics here. And here I see that on the line three, I inserted the, uh, the arrow asoc. So I have the implicit conversion. And it also tells me that you know, this one actually takes a type. So this is the type that has been inserted. All right. Um, if we run it on a slightly larger example, this is what I showed with the location at the very beginning, then we get all of this, right? So I see that there was this ordering to order, there was this tuple to, and these are the type, uh, sorry, these are the type parameters, and these were the actual parameters, the implicit arguments that were injected. You know, this is all that the Scala compiler injects for you. And now I have it here. So that's pretty cool. Um, the way how it is represented, if I show you the, the actual tree, so this is what you get if you load the protocol buffers. So here you see that you have the uh, ty uh, apply tree, apply tree, type apply tree. So basically, everything that was in the code, you load it, and now you can uh, traverse it. Right? So that's the ultimate tool for the, uh, the, the static analysis for, for us and, and for many others. And also, all of these are basically uh, ADTs, those are case classes that were generated through the uh, protocol buffer compiler. So the, the last thing what we need to figure out is what is that, right? Because everything is stored as a string. So if I have a Scala math ordered ordering to order, what it actually means. You know, the, uh, the, the parents at the end, they kind of uh, give you a hint that might be a, a function call. But if I would like to know more about it, I actually have to consult uh, some symbolic table. And the, uh, the semantic DB, they actually provide a module which is called a, a SimTab. So what you can do is that if you import it and you have your class path correctly set, then you can actually query. And what it will do, it will lazily go through the class path, try to find the class, load the definition, and present the definition in some kind of a form that they defined. All right? So the trick part is to actually find the, to put the correct path, class path, but if you manage, then you know, for this given thing, you will get that this is a simple information. It's actually a method. Here is some magic number, which in this case indicates that it's actually implicit. And then here you have some other details. Right? So this is the second part of the thing that I need in order to be, figure, be able to figure out what are the cases where the implicits are being used. Um, the, the structure that they have is very good if, because it's very generic. But it would be very difficult to query. So if you would like to ask, OK, so what are all the implicit call sites, it will be kind of uh, clumsy. 
And also because we want to look into many projects, we actually have to really resolve it. So we really want to resolve all the symbols which are there from the class path. So we don't, we don't have to carry all the jars with our analysis, right? So we defined uh, kind of a different, the, our intermediate representation is a little bit simpler. We have basically a call side, which is some declaration reference. And that declaration reference is actually stored with our data as well. Um, we know exactly you know, in which file it was, what was the position. Then we have all the type reference of all the different things which were used. So this is a very nice way because now you can easily, easily see how you can query this, how you can get all the call sites which are using uh, implicit conversion of a particular type. And that's the call, right? So what we can do now is that we can do this kind of queries. You know, given a sequence of call sites that I just loaded from our representation, you know, I can find quickly an implicit conversion. An implicit conversion is, well, the simpler one is that, you know, the declaration of what I'm calling has to be implicit, and the parameter list is either one or it's two, but in that case, the second parameter list must be marked as implicit, right? Because implicit conversion, they can take implicit parameters. And if I have that, I can run this query and figure out in this project how many implicit conversions are being used. And then if I run it on the bigger data set, then I will get even, even more information. So again, I can go back to GitHub, download all the projects, and, and start doing the analysis. So that's what we did. Um, this is our pipeline. So we have all the uh, GitHub projects fetched uh, via uh, GH torrent. I don't know if you know what the GH torrent is, but it's basically like an external database where they uh, sort of store all the metadata that are available on GitHub, and then you can download it. It has a couple of terab uh, well, I think it's like 100 gigabytes now, and it's basically uh, CSV files. You extract them, and they get all the commits, you get all the projects, you get all the stargazers, and all this information, right? So we use that to bootstrap. So we basically downloaded all the projects which we're mentioning there. Then, so we do the git clone, then we generate the, the uh, semantic database, we generate some metadata, which is mostly to figure out what are the class path of each of the file, sorry, each of the project, and then we extract our model and then we can run our analysis. Um, but there is one little catch. If you do this kind of a large scale analysis, you all also have to think about duplicates. Because now we are going to analyze code which is out there on GitHub, and there's a lot of mess in the wild, right? Um, and there is fortunately a tool which is called Deja Vu, which is also done in our lab. And what they do is that they can provide this kind of a map, oops, this kind of a map of duplicates. So the way how it reads, this is the number of files, this is the number of commits, and then th each of the tile is basically aggregation of all the project which falls in that category. So for example, here we have about 100 uh, files and about 10 commits. And the 44 is the number of duplication, it's the percentage. So it's the, uh, the unique files over the, uh, all the files. So in Scala, actually, the ecosystem is pretty healthy, right? You have some kind of outliers in here. So that's basically when someone didn't do a fork properly. What someone did, that downloaded Apache Spark and committed it as his project, right? So then he has one commit, but he has over, you know, close to 10,000 files. And all of them are duplicate, 96%. And people do that a lot, actually. Surprisingly. So if you want to do a good analysis, what you have to do is actually you have to filter these out. There's an interesting other outlier here. You know, it's a 100% duplicate. It's one file, but over 10,000 commits. It's interesting, right? That's, uh, it's actually uh, machine generated. So there is this project called the uh, Rockstar. So if you want to be a Rockstar on GitHub, you know, you just download this project and run it. And what it does, it will generate for you a sequence of, comment, uh, of commits. So then you have this kind of a nice timeline, all right? Um, and you can choose the language in which you want to rockstar, that's the best part. So this is the, uh, another representation of the, the duplication. So actually in Scala, it's really nice. Uh, most of the projects, they have like zero, close to zero duplication, right? So this is the, the level of duplication. And the, the width of this violin plot is basically how many projects you have. Then you have few projects which has duplications, and then at the end, you have quite a lot. And if you analyze this closely, you will realize that these are all the projects which are basically the uh, functional uh, programming in Scala, the Coursera course. You know, people put their solution on GitHub, there are many of them, and they look alike, right? So that's, this is the, the, the major jungle here. Um, 
So to give you some numbers, uh, so from 2017, we downloaded about 70,000 projects, uh, about 68,000 were unique. Uh, these were without the uh, duplicates and that we can run the semantic DB on. Um, 8,000, sorry, so these were, uh, I made a mistake. So these are the non-empty projects, actually people commit empty projects as well. Uh, these are the unique ones, and these are the ones that we managed to run semantic DB on. And the reason for that is because we use the version uh, two, and that could analyze only a certain version of Scala code. So if the Scala code wouldn't fall exactly into being 2, 11, 13 or something, it would just crash, even though we tried to do certain hacks. Uh, nowadays, there is the semantic DB four, and that actually can analyze much more, and that's what we are currently doing. So this is about 8.2 million lines of code, uh, about 12 millions of call sites, and it takes about 800 gigabytes of data, and it's about four gigabytes of the model that I showed you, right? So this is one representation. I think I can skip to this one. So if you look at the project, on average, uh, there's about 1,000 lines of code, and on average, they have about 10 uh, GitHub stars, but most of the project, they really just have no GitHub stars. So the mean would be really shifted close to the close to one. So now finally, how the implicits are being used to show you some numbers, and this is the work in progress. So this is the map of all the call sites, right? So we have one bar, like one line per project, and this shows you the, uh, the, the percentage of the call sites which are implicit. So on average, we have about 16% of all the call sites in our Scala code is uh, implicit call sites, which is quite a lot. Um, these are the breakdowns, so most of them involve parameters. They have quite a lot of conversions, and there are about 10% of this number is uh, that we use both. So this is a call site, which is a conversion and takes implicit parameters. Um, this is another representation that we can see that, you know, um, there's a a lot of projects declaring implicit, so there's more than half of all the projects that we look at, they were declaring some form of implicit. Um, and we broke them to applications and libraries, so the library is something which is indexed by the Scaladex, and the application is what is not. So you see that 77% of libraries, so that makes sense, like, you know, library, they define the implicits for you, so you as a user can use them, but still people actually define implicits in their own code, which is pretty interesting. Uh, if you look at the call sites and when they are, maybe it's a little bit hard to read, but here we have the split between the application and, and, and library. And we see that actually the, the majority of, of the calls are actually coming from the tests, right? Especially in the library. The reason is that the, uh, everybody's using Scala test and the Scala test defines a lot of, uh, of, of implicit conversion. If you break it a little bit more, here we have the, the, the project code itself. This is the implicits that come from the uh, project dependencies. This is the implicit that come from the uh, Scala standard library, and these are the testing dependencies. All right, so it's really the, the main two contributors is Scala <coughs> standard library and the, uh, and the testing. Um, just to give you some summary, 25% of projects, they define some implicit conversions, so that includes even a regular application, so actually people do define uh, conversions for their own use and for their own consumption. Um, the, uh, the majority is non-local. So if you have a conversion in your code, then it's coming from some uh, from Scala library or from uh, from some of your dependency, and most of it is going to be from the uh, from testing. And what is good is that most of the, uh, the the conversions actually convert from something to their own type, right? So these are fairly safe conversions. It's not that you are converting from some other types to some other type and just letting float around. And so it seems that the conversion kind of converged into this fairly safe pattern. Um, there's just a breakup of the number of uh, implicit uh, declaration in applications and in libraries. So in libraries, again, we see that the pattern that people define way more, uh, this is log scale, so way more uh, conversions uh, than, than application code. Um, it's just yet another thing. So ooh. when we look at the type classes, uh, about 20% of all the implicit calls that we saw, there were actually some kind of uh, type classes. Um, and as you would have guessed, the, uh, the majority comes from the uh, Scala standard library because there's, it's used a lot. And then you have these are the frameworks which comes right after it. So again, there's not much of a surprise. Um, and this is my last slide. So this is also one of the uh, type class that we found. 
Um, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting code, <laughs> but I suggest that the, uh, you don't write something like that, right? Because um, the good type classes and the good conversion, they have one property, and that's if you look at them, there is immediately obvious what it's doing. You know, good code is the boring one, which is kind of obvious what you do. This is maybe, you know, you have a lot of, of the uh, category theory acrobacy in there, but it just doesn't make any sense. So please don't do that. Um, so let me conclude with that. Um, implicit gives you superpower, so use them with care. Um, you can use Scala Meta and Semantic DB to analyze your code or other code. That's they are really cool tools and they work really well. Um, implicits are really, really everywhere. So most of the project, you will see some trace of that. They seem to be used in the safe way, but that's you have to still look into that a little bit more. And um, if you want to know something, ask data. Thank you very much. About uh, Git project, did you only look into the master branches or all, all branches like on the no, Git no, project? Only the master okay. So at the very beginning, we had this kind of a hierarchy because the Sorry. So the, the question was if we look only in the master branch or the other branches. No, what we did was that we only check out the, uh, the master branch. And at the beginning, we had this kind of heuristic. So if it doesn't compile, then we will try five tucks in the, in the, in the back. But I was just taking so much time. And the, the, the major thing is that you really have to spawn the uh, SBT, and the SBT takes a lot of time, and it was just way too, 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 too slow. So we just discarded the project. We couldn't compile immediately. Yeah, so uh, I have a question. So right now, we have a confusing pattern in our application that we have a hard time uh, solving. So we are basically initializing a large API with a lot of uh, implicits. And uh, we use uh, cats effects, et cetera. So we basically have a stream where we just, you know, in a huge four yield, <laughs> we start initializing everything, uh, even though our code is like purely functional. So I was wondering if you have a pattern for that. Uh, I was considering, you know, putting implicits everywhere and just. Uh, no, no, not no? anything that I've seen so far by looking in, he in, in here. OK. Thank you. Uh, do you think do you think it's possible to make a time series of the use of implicit with the data you have? Yeah, that, that was one of the things that we uh, wanted to do, but the, uh, it turned out to be very difficult because, um, like, to do it uh, precisely using the, uh, the the semantic DB, that's going to be very tricky because we cannot go really much and uh, backwards because the uh, semantic DB only compiles uh, Scala version 2.12.14 and up and 2.11.13 and up or something like that, right? Um, so we tried that on a few and it just uh, failed miserably. What we could do is to look actually at the definition because that's much simpler. We just need to parse the AST and that's something that would be really interesting because I think we will see this kind of a emerging pattern that the, uh, that the number of implicit conversion kind of uh, goes down from what it used to be. Um, have you looked uh, at going to more details into which implicits are provided by the Scala standard library? And I'm mostly thinking of uh, any to string add. Is that like when you say 20% come from the standard library, how many come from pre-dev? Um, so there are basically three major contributors. The major one is the pre-dev, and it's this one and the uh, conversion to RO, you know, the RO ASOC. Um, then you have collections. Right, because there you have the can build from. Uh, that's a, quite a lot. And then you have the uh, uh, Scala math, the ordering. So people tend to order a lot, and that's why they are bringing all of this in. All right, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>